thank you everyone for joining us. Um, got a really exciting webinar in store for you today. Steph has been coming to the Girls on Track events for the past year. So it's really nice to see her join us here today. Thank you so much, Steph. Before we proceed, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, that we're all dialing in from and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Huge thank you to Michelin for presenting tonight's webinar. I'll hand over to Girls on Track Ambassador Kate Peck to lead the conversation. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, yes, so I'm Kate Peck. Um, I'm a motorsport reporter and I'm a journalist. Uh, and I've been working in the industry for about 10 years now across uh, Formula One, MotoGP, Supercars. And uh, now I host the live broadcast of the Australian Superbike Championship and Primex because I am mad for motorcycles. Um, so today we're talking communications and PR and motorsport and automotive with the one and only boss, Queen Stephanie Weiser. So as Pre already kind of did, I'd like to welcome you, Steph, um, say a huge thank you for being here with us today. We've had so many people register, best numbers ever, so um, we've decided that you are hot property. Um, Steph, <laughs> your face might be quite familiar to um, some of our viewers because you have been such a big supporter of the Girls on Track program, attending so many of our events and um, sharing your insights and knowledge with the girls um, during our networking events. And uh, we often talk about this with the with the girls on track, girls, that uh, no two stories are um, the same. Um, getting a role in motorsport is very different for everybody and Steph's, um, Steph's story is no different. Um, Steph was born in Germany, uh, studied in Germany and then moved to Australia for further education and um, a career. And while she was in Australia, she realised she wanted to work for a Formula One team. So can't wait to get into that chat to hear more of your story, Steph, um, and that amazing journey uh, to get there and afterwards to move into um, automotive. So I'll chat with Steph for about 40 minutes and then um, – and then we'll get Steph to answer all your questions for about 20 minutes. So if you have any questions, you're dialing in, please um, drop them in the Q&A box below. You can do this while we're chatting and um, we'll get through them, hopefully all of them at the end. So let's kick off, Steph. Um, from the beginning, so you were born in Germany, as I mentioned, you studied there, you moved to Australia. At some point, you decided that you wanted to work for an F1 team. So you went back to Europe. Um, how did you know or decide that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. It's so great to be part of the Girls on Track program. Uh, getting right into it, yeah. So I I migrated to Australia after I finished my undergraduate degree in Germany and basically started my career in Australia. And I think when you start out straight after uni, you kind of have an idea of what you want to do, but not really. And um, so it just so happened that um, my first job right out of uni, I started working in communications for the state government here in Victoria. And um, after that, I joined uh, a marketing team at RMIT University. And so I had a really good manager back then who was very um, focused on career potential and career development. And one day she asked me the classic question, you know, where do you see yourself in five years from now and also 10 years from now? And I guess kind of prompted a thinking process for me. And um, being very green and very honest, I told her that one day maybe I'll gain enough experience to work in Formula One, maybe in, you know, 10, 15 years when I've got lots of experience. And so this was around 2009, 2010. Um, and even before moving to Australia, um, I was, you know, always following Formula One. My mom was a huge Michael Schumacher fan. So I grew up watching the races with her every Sunday. And um, later on, Sebastian Vettel came into Formula One and my whole family basically follows him because he is his hometown is um, the town right next to where my aunt and uncle live. Um, so we're all really big uh, supporters of Seb. And um, in the German media, of course, you read lots about the German drivers, um, but also um, back then the media was featuring um, Sebastian's uh, press officer quite prominently, Britta Röske. And so I had read about um, about her and what she does and what her role is. 
supporting Seb. And I thought, oh, well, I'm in public relations and she is in public relations and she's got a really cool job. So um, it would be amazing to become and do, you know, what she does one day. And so, yeah, I found myself having moved all across the globe um, to a country that probably couldn't be possibly further away from where all the Formula One action is, which is obviously Europe, except maybe New Zealand is a bit further away. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, when you're in your early 20s um, or even in high school and, you you know, trying to think about selecting the right subjects to get into a certain university degree, it's just really difficult to really know what you want. Sometimes you just have to get started somewhere in order to um, to figure it out. So I knew I loved my profession um, and then sort of formulated that goal once I've started working. And what did you study, Steph? I study corporate communications and public relations. Yeah, great. So um, what steps or actions did you um, undertake to make sure that you reached your goal? Great question. Um, So when when I realised what I wanted to do, I also realised that I had no idea on how I would be able to get there. So I thought because Formula One is the top echelon of motorsport, I would need lots of experience, not just in communications, but also within the industry. Um, And then you quickly get this chicken and egg situation, you know, who will give you experience when you haven't got any industry experience. And this came up again in my um, career development conversation with my manager at RMIT. And she suggested, um, you know, why don't you volunteer? So I researched um, several options and pretty quickly came across um, the officiating options at Motorsport Australia. And so my husband and I signed up and became motorsport officials, um, first at smaller race meetings and then at a few V8 supercar races. And, um, you know, in the end, even um, I man- even managed to get into a um, session as a pit lane marshal at Alder Park in you know, for Formula One. And I thought, oh, this is pretty cool because a year before I was in the Fangio stand opposite the pits looking across and like, oh, one day I want to be behind the fence. And there I sort of was behind the fence. Um, But yeah, it's not quite a career, obviously, but, you know, I made progress towards it, I guess. And um, even getting to that point as a marshal takes quite a bit of resilience so when my husband and I first started officiating you know it was all but glamorous um you really know you're passionate about something when you stood in pit lane at Phillip Island with an with an icy southerly blasting through I'm sure anyone that was at MotoGP last weekend knows exactly what I'm talking about yeah um so yeah you're not just there for you know the V8 races you're there all day supporting all sorts of race categories and I guess another thing also that differentiated the experience a little bit for the both of us was that I was a woman and because not many women were officiating back then, um, I could pretty much express my interest in certain um, volunteering positions and would quite easily be put in those positions. Whereas my husband, he found himself sitting in a tent at the back of sand down for like an entire weekend measuring sound or noise levels, right? So he was not that amused while I was in pit lane getting all the action. <laughs> but um, I'm super, super grateful for his support because ultimately, you know, that gave me the experience um, to put something on my CV in connection to the industry. And, um, yeah, I guess that shows um, love, right? <laughs> and after all the support that my manager at RMIT gave me as well in sort of even getting there, she also... Um, helped me um, in writing a glowing review for me to be able to take the next step in my career. So um, I had looked for opportunities to also um, work-wise move into the right direction and found an agency that was doing lots of work in with automotive clients and motorsport clients. And um, I interviewed with them, but I actually wasn't successful in getting the role that I applied for. Um, they said I was... I came in close second, but back back then they wanted someone with TV experience and broadcast experience. So that's who they hired. And I said, oh, but, you know, you really were close second. So stay in touch with us. And maybe if you 
you know, in a few months we'll have something um, for you. And so um, that's what I did. I stayed in touch and a, a few months later um, actually joined the agency. So um, which is nice to be able to also professionally move in, in, in the right direction. So, yeah, I volunteered. I moved my career in the right direction. And um, I think a crucial part of what I did to work towards my goal was um, networking. Um, so naturally following, being interested in Formula One, so following all the races um, and sessions, I jumped on Twitter to also stay um, close to the action. So not just watching um, TV, we only had free to air. So you, you get what's happening in the session, but jumping on Twitter, you then can follow the teams that were live tweeting. You can follow journalists. Um, some of the drivers were on there as well. And um, through that, because Twitter was quite conversational, I met um, heaps of journalists in F1. I even met people like myself who was, you know, huge Formula One fans, but also wanted to move um, into that direction professionally. So when the Australian Grand Prix came around, um, I arranged some catch-ups with some of the journals. And one of them invited me along to a um, press event where um, he introduced me to Britta Röske, Sepp's um, PR manager. And so all of a sudden I found myself sitting on a table with her and all the German Formula One um, journalists. And I told them about my goal and, you know, that I'm working towards getting there, getting industry experience. And so that was um, pretty amazing. But also at the same time, um, I was talking to people. I was talking to a woman in the UK and in Brazil one wanted to become an engineer, another one wanted to become a journalist. So we kept talking to each other as well and um, and stayed in touch. So, yeah, I guess that's sort of the three components that I did. I volunteered, I gained industry experience in my career and and I, I networked um, with the goal of perhaps one day, you know, in 10, 15 years, um, making it into, into F1. But... um. For those who truly know me, they know that I'm a really impatient person. It's probably one of my biggest weaknesses. So um, every week I would jump on all the websites of all the teams and 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 check, you know, availability for jobs and all that. And I was like, literally, I was so impatient that I actually sent expressions of interest to my top five teams. Because I thought, well, I can either let them know that I'm interested in working in F1 and maybe they say, hey, come join us. Or maybe they say nothing and I'll just continue doing what I'm doing, right? Nothing changes. But if I don't try, then nothing will happen anyway. So uh, I never heard back from any of those teams. Um, but I did eventually see a job opening at, um, at the Sauber F1 team uh, for a communications role. And um, I had done a bit of research as to who was in the role previously. And I knew that that person was there for quite a long time. So again, I thought, you know, even if I don't have enough experience, I might as well give it a shot because what's the worst that can happen? They say no and nothing changes and I continue to work towards my goal. Um, but yeah, it it turned out that I was the, the right fit for the role. And, um, and that's how I ended up um, in F1. So it was a quite a quick journey then almost. You were in was. one role. Yeah, you you between. had one role in kind of in between and then you just got on the hustle. Yeah. Just went yeah. hard. It happened way quicker. So in between. Yeah, so was it only a, cu a couple of years or so? Maybe two yeah, years. Yeah, it or was something? about two years. Yeah. Yeah, wow. That's amazing. It's so cool to hear that story of using so much initiative there and really thinking outside of the the square by going on Twitter and just expressions of interest like <laughs> great um just just bringing it back to um volunteering and officiating because mm. it's something that we really encourage the um, girls on track girls to get into um you know approach your local club um everybody needs volunteers there are most of them are volunteers and they all need officials uh, and it's a really great way to learn more about racing and um 
and and network, as you said. In terms of um, yeah. your volunteering um, and officiating uh, and your resume, do you think that it did help to have it on your resume? Um, was it received well in the interview process? Do you think it gave you a, a leg up? Yes, yes, I think it, it certainly did. Um, I think volunteering, you know, it definitely gives an, in, an insight into the sport because you learn um, a lot about the rules and regulations, all the ins and outs that as a spectator, not necessarily everyone is aware of or even would be interested in. Um, you also find yourself at the executing end of enforcing those rules. So whether you're flag marshal or you're in pit lane measuring speed or you're in scrutineering measuring certain things in the car, making sure they're sort of sticking to the rule book, it inevitably not only gives you insight but also solid knowledge as well. And um, as I mentioned before, I think it tests it tests your passion. Um, you know, not all fishing, officiating jobs are glamorous, especially if the weather is bad. Um, some are, but most aren't. So you will find out pretty quickly how badly you really want to work in water sport. It's not for everyone, um, but you don't know it until you're in it. So, um, yeah, and I did highlight that on my CV um, in the volunteering section, um, but I also definitely made sure I highlighted it in my cover letter when I was applying for roles. And I think it comes up naturally in a conversation during the interview. It certainly did come up in the conversation with Salba. Because I think people in motorsport, you know, they're very, they know that without volunteers and officials, none of these session, sessions would even run. It just wouldn't be possible. So people across all motorsports um, categories, are, I think, are very aware of the work that um, officials and volunteers do mm. and recognize this, this passion. So, yeah. Yeah. And so, and also you talked about networking to something else that we stress mm. the major importance of because I know that without my networking I would not be anywhere near where I am now um it is so much about who you know you you know it's it is a little bit about what you know that definitely helps but man who you know is very important um so obviously you realize that early in your career but is mm. that something that is still very important to you now and is there any advice uh, for the girls when it comes to building networks and relationships because uh, it can be an, a very intimidating thing uh, and a difficult thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've always loved networking. I, I, I'm generally curious about people and people's stories. And I think the trick with networking is to shift an initial contact into a meaningful connection and relationship um, sometimes I think it can be really easy, you know, to contact someone and they might even reply, but then where do you go from there? So just because you connect with someone on, say, LinkedIn, um, doesn't matter. You've actually built uh, a solid connection. Um, so, you know, I've talked about how I use Twitter back in the day. These days, I probably wouldn't use Twitter. Um, it doesn't really matter what platform you use. I mean, you know, platforms are slightly different. LinkedIn is obviously you know, front of mind is networking, but not everybody's interested in that. Not everybody frequently checks their LinkedIn. Um, you could also connect through DM on Instagram, for example, you know, especially when people post a lot about what they're doing. Uh, you could even use TikTok. Um, so yeah, platforms are different, but um, I guess regardless, I think you just have to back yourself and also not get disheartened because it is difficult um, to reach out to people and to put yourself out there. Um, but, um, you know, if someone doesn't reply, most likely this has nothing to do with you and everything to do with the other person being busy or maybe not seeing their messages or maybe not checking their messages. And in this regard, you know, I always think of the saying that I'd rather be the one that smiled than the one that didn't smile back. So I'd rather be the one that reached out than the one that didn't, didn't reply. So, and it's not about it's not about making a million connections, um, but it's about making the right connections and making those meaningful. Um, so yeah. it's about making the conversation relevant and, you know, and looking at really looking at pe what people do, what topics they post about and 
what it is that deeply interests you and what they do. Um, and I think Joanne talked about this a little bit in the last webinar about not being generic, but about re being really specific. And I think also sometimes, and this is really basic, you know, I go to networking events, pe people connect with me, but no one ever follows up. And it's really important to know that when you're networking and you are connecting with someone, you're initiating that first contact is that it, the ball is in your court to follow up. Um, because at the end of the day, it's like shopping. So imagine you sell something, in this case, your skills and your keenness and your willingness to contribute and to get an experience or a job or an interview or an internship. So the other person has no idea who you are and what you can do. So it's up to you to let them know what you can bring to the table. And I think, um, you know, it, it shows like that agency job that I applied for and didn't get. I made sure I followed up. They say, hey, maybe a few months down the track, we have something. And I was the one that followed up. If I hadn't followed up, maybe they didn't even advertise it. So it was the same actually mm -hmm. when I left my role at Salba. Um, the candidate that had missed out when I got the role, they rang her up straight away um, and she was pretty much in. So it's really important to follow up. Um, and even if, you know, you knock on a million doors and one is half open, but it didn't quite work out. Stay in touch, mm. keep in touch, keep the relationship open. Sometimes it's just, you know, there's so many parts that have to fall into place. It's right people, right timing, yeah. right place. Yeah. Yeah. And it's always good to, no one minds a reminder. Like people are busy these yeah. days. If you have to send them, you know, a, a polite hi, just checking if you got my last email, email, you know, then that's, I think that's, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing to do because I know that, you know, sometimes you just miss the first one and you're like, that's oh, right. I'll get to that. And then you just, and then life happens and, that's right. and then you get a, a reminder and you're like, oh gosh, yes, that's great. Now I feel bad about not responding to that person in the first place. So I'll write back to them immediately. Yeah. Um, and especially um, in water sport, but, right? Like lots of people are on the road. Yeah. So there might be, yeah, it's just really easy to miss miss messages yeah totally totally mm -hmm. um so let's talk about your role at Salba, the um alpha romeo f1 team um like so you get your dream job and how was it starting it must have been uh it must have been intimidating um as and i'm sure a lot of people watching will have um you know similar but different um positions like like that you know you'll be going to a new job and you uh, won't know anyone and it's really scary mm. and um the first week is tough and you're learning new processes and systems how how was it in the the initial stages for you um in f1 yeah it was um for me it was baptism by fire so my first day on the job was the wednesday at the australian grand prix so, because oh, wow. I'd lived in Australia and so we had gone through the interview process and I had been to Switzerland to the factory um, for the interview, but because of the timing, it, it so worked out that, um, yeah, that my first day was the Wednesday at the, at the Australian Grand Prix. So um, I was pretty much straight into it. And um, I think the networking really helped me out because I at least if I didn't know or connect with them, I knew of the key journalists in the paddock. So um, that really helped. And I had done, you know, lots and lots of research beforehand. But um, yeah, in terms of on the job, I was pretty much, yeah, straight into the straight into the deep end. And um, cool. I don't even want to start talk, thinking about the systems and stuff like that to send out press releases and all that. So um, but I had I had an amazing team um, that supported me, um, which was which was really really good. What did the what did the role entail? Um, and I guess what is somebody say um, any of our viewers watching that uh, might wonder what kind of mm -hmm. a PR entry level role um, kind of entails as well. Yeah. So I was communications manager, and that means that I was responsible for um, all drivers' communications and team communications, and my manager would look after team management communications. Um, but essentially, we kept um, we both kept each other across um, everything that was sort of going on and happening. 
So if you look at a typical race weekend, you know, the, the preparation would usually start way earlier. So it, it usually starts when Formula One releases um, the schedule for a weekend. And that obviously determines all the on-track sessions and everything that needs to happen around that, around the core job. And then um, I would also always work in very close collaboration with the marketing teams um, and then develop media engagements for the race weekend. So close collaboration with the marketing team is really, really essential, especially back in the day when a lot of the social media channels were just starting out um, you or just launched. So you really want to make sure, you know, once you start that content, basically keep feeding it. Um, and I think Joanne also talked about it. She has obviously a lot more recent experience in terms of content creation and, and stuff like that. From, um, from a PR perspective, yeah, you would be basically be planning the weekend, um, planning the media roundtables, one-on-one interviews, and, and then once you hit the ground, usually on the first day, the team would get together with the drivers and management and we would brief everybody on what's been happening in the media, what, what are the hot topics, what is everybody talking about, what do we want to talk about as a team, whether we have any major announcements, um, what we don't want to talk about as a team, what the controversies could be that could be brought up in interviews, um, basically, yeah, just preparations. And then the schedule that you have planned sort of rolled out over the weekend um, but most importantly, you also deal with everything that is unexpected. So uh, that's that's where the juice is, right? That's that's why we love the sport is when the unexpected happens. And one thing is for sure, it will happen. And then you have, from a communications perspective, the world media right on your doorstep, right? So it's all about being agile and and managing managing that as well. So in a nutshell, basically every race, every test in between races, you'd be at the factory um, planning ahead for the next event. And um, yes, yeah, so basically managing what's planned, but more importantly, also managing uh, what's unplanned from a communications perspective. Wow. And would you travel with a team everywhere? Yes. Yeah. How cool. So you live in a rock star lifestyle. <laughs> It was a little bit. It's a traveling circus. That's what it is. <laughs> Big yeah. world bubble in F one. Yeah, yeah. I'm putting out lots of fires. I would imagine. Was it a little bit stressful? Oh yeah. Sometimes it can be uh, really stress- stressful. And um, I think you know, in any motorsport comms role, um, it can get really real in motorsport sometimes, especially when there's accidents. Um, because it's you know it's people involved at the end of the day. So yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And then you, uh, well, first of all, why did you leave Formula One? It's, it's <laughs> everybody's dream gig. Yeah. Um, well, it was a personal decision. It was a life decision. So uh, I'm originally from Germany, as you know. And so for me, it was quite easily to, you know, go over, live in Switzerland and Hinville, um, no problems. But my partner and I, back then, we were not married and he's not European. So there was a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of difficulty getting him a permanent visa and that sort of kept dragging on. And then I I was ultimately faced with making a decision and I chose to come back to Australia. I had been living in Australia for four years already. I loved the lifestyle. And so I chose to come, come back to Australia. Great. Well, we're so happy that you did because <laughs> now we've got you. Um, and so you moved back to, to Oz um, to work with Porsche Cars Australia yeah. um, as a public relations manager. So what did that what did that entail and um, and how did that role come about for you? Is that something you organised while you were overseas? Um, I mean, you're probably pretty close to headquarters at some stages while you were over there. So, uh, yeah, how did how did that come about? Yeah. So I joined Porsche as PR manager um, on my return to Australia. It came about through um, just having conversations. So obviously people in the team knew I was leaving, they knew I was going back to Australia. And um, there was a few conversations of people introducing me to people over here and having conversations in Australia. And then at the end of the day, it was um, just, yeah, talking to the right people and also timing that the role was actually available. I had literally just landed and um, yeah, a comms role was available at Porsche, so I applied. 
Um, and that was, I guess, compared to Formula One, it was a big focus shift. Um, it was more pro more of a product focused role. So um, think about when a new car comes to market, you know, all the PR around that, <clears throat> that you see all the reviews, um, the actual press launch and all that. Um, and in addition to that, Porsche also has extensive shared and owned media channels. So all the socials, the Porsche newsroom, the, the brand actually creates the content. And I think when you have such an aspirational brand, and one of the most luxurious sports car brands in the world, it extends beyond just product releases. So you basically become um, a custodian of the brand and everything that you do. Yeah, great. And did um, and the role was it um, was it really busy? Did it surprise you? Was there a lot to to learn when you made that shift to um, to automotive? Yeah, it was definitely a busy role. Um, and I was keen to learn because um, I guess coming from Formula One where things can get quite technical um, and motorsport rules and regulations, you know, I wanted to know exactly how the ins and outs of all the cars, like especially a new car, you know, um, why it's better, why it's good. And Porsche is also as a sports car brand quite detailed in, in, the, in, in the engineering piece. So, um, yeah, it's you naturally become a subject matter expert um, as a as a PR person and um, yeah it was a phenomenal in terms of you know being able to to join a brand essentially again that I grew up with um, Porsche is a big employer in Germany and um, I think we have like you know AFR best places to work in Australia and it's sort of Porsche is sort of you know that top ranked employer um, and to be able yeah. to to join a brand like that um, in the place that I chose to live, which is on the other side of the world, was was pretty nice. Oh, you've you really nailed it, haven't you, Steph? <laughs> you've ticked a lot of a lot of career boxes, I reckon, in a pretty short time. You've got some good luck. You hopefully rub rub off onto everybody watching this. Um, so and we often tell the girls that you know motorsport is great, but you you can and you should often look um, look beyond it to to automotive um, as as an option. Working with OEMs such as Porsche. Ford, Ferrari, I mean, a lot of these manufacturers um, are involved in in motorsport. Um, so you've also, you, I mean, you found yourself working in both motorsport and automotive. Um, just quickly tell us a little bit about the roles that are available that you see um, popping up that might be relevant to, um, to our audience. Yeah, yeah, I think... Um, there's still plenty of opportunities in the automotive industry in Australia. So uh, Australia is one of the most competitive car markets in the world in terms of how many brands are represented in market. And if you broaden that um, from OEMs to um, suppliers, then ex it extends again in the wider automotive industry. And of course, this doesn't just go for comms roles, but for all sorts of roles. And I sometimes think that Australians underestimate the opportunity of being so far away. Um, I think that you can actually turn that into an advantage because Australia is so far away. You can really make your skills and your expertise that you hone here. You can really make that shine if you want to go um, and also succeed overseas. I think one of the deciding factors that I got the job at Salba um, which was, you know, you mentioned it was actually, I reached my goal quite quickly. But um, the reason behind that was that I'm a German native speaker and that I had lived in an English speaking country for four years. Um, and I had experience and showed that that passion for motorsport through the volunteering and the agency work that I did. Um, so Sauber published press releases in German and English. And so I perfectly fit that comms need that they needed um, and against all all the odds, you know, like 10 year plan that I had. Um, so think about these unique traits that you may have, you know, and the skills and the experience that you may have. So if you speak Italian, you know, that's probably an advantage if you want to work for Ferrari um, or, you know, on a more technical and engineering front, when I joined Sauber, I had, quite a few mechanics and engineers come up to me um, in, in the office and said, oh, you moved from Australia. We love V8 supercars, you know, and they they were all over the championship. They knew all 
about everything that was happening about the teams, the drivers, the standings. They love the series. So don't underestimate being from Australia. The the world knows we have good motorsport here. And um, it might seem far away, but it, it might actually just give you the competitive advantage and the competitive mm. edge that you need. Yeah, offering something different because I guess what we do have down here is very unique to anywhere else in Absolutely. the world. Yeah. Um, so now you've you've moved on to a new challenge, an opportunity as a corporate affairs lead with car sales. So what does that role entail and what does your, you know, your day-to-day kind of look like? Mm. Yeah, after eight years with Porsche, I thought it was time for a bit of a new challenge and perhaps also an industry change. So although car is obviously from the center and the name car sales essentially it's a tech company it's a marketplace and um, the past 14 months have been really fun to get to know not only new industry but also new company and company culture and again my day-to-day has shifted the focus has shifted quite a bit again from what was product very product and consumer focused at at Porsche to now more corporate and strategic communications and Corporate comms or corporate affairs can sometimes be a bit ambiguous and mean slightly different things in different organizations. But essentially, um, in my role at Car Sales, I basically look after any group communications that are not related to consumer. And that includes also topics like sustainability and employer brand. And certainly for an ASX listed company, um, there's plenty to do in, in the corporate space and what not many people in Australia realizes actually that car sales as a group has also businesses in other countries. Um, So there's sort of a a global component in in my role um, as well, which is a lot of fun. Yeah. Wow. So you've really touched on, you know, three, almost three different industries there, like motorsport, automotive, but also tech. Mm. Um, And you're still able to keep, you know, connected with cars. Um, So, yeah, that just shows shows the the level of opportunity. There's so, you you know, you really think outside the square there. Um, And just finally, um, for someone looking to follow in your footsteps, which would be quite difficult, I imagine, uh, but working in PR and communications in in motorsport or automotive, um, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think... You know, believe in yourself and keep keep chipping away at your dream. You know, what like if you look at my CV um, and you now know the background, you know that, you know, I, I didn't always make it on the first attempt. I had plenty of fails in there. Um, it all happened really fast in the end, but um, you don't always succeed at, at the first goal that you're having. So believe in yourself and keep chipping away at your dream because no one else is going to do it for you. I was like a dog with a bone, right? So build your network, use your network. When, you know, I, I would have loved to have a program like Girls on Track. Um, definitely network with your peers. You know, I said I was in touch with um, women in the UK and Brazil and we'd shared each other along. And one of the sweetest moments actually, um, probably of my career was when um, one day I had organized a one-on-one interview for one of our drivers and the journalist that came in for motorsport.com.au was that woman was the woman that I was talking to in the UK. So she initially paid her own way to as many Grand Prix as possible and just started writing a blog and eventually made it as a journalist. And so when we met to have that interview, both on you know different sides of the table, me as a PR, she as a journalist, we just, you know, we looked at each other and we we knew we we kind of we did it and we did it together because we were supporting each other. So um definitely definitely value your peer network um as well and as hard you know as it sometimes is don't let yourself down if at first you don't succeed just go back to the drawing board work harder and I I believe that if you really really want something and you really want to get there if you work hard enough in the end you you'll get there and you'll succeed agreed just persevere and just have Plan A to go to. (laughs) Excellent. Well, that is that is us wrapped up for our little Q and A. Steph, Um, so much information in there. It's just fascinating to um, hear your background. Now we're going to hear from from the crowd. Um, Priyanka, do you want to kick off with questions, or do you want 
Is there any particular ones that you'd like to start with? I'm just having a look at them right now. Yeah, we can go and... one each. It's always fun like that. Yep. Cool. <laughs> just, po just pointing out, just uh, pointing out what Steph just said about the friendships at the MotoGP on the weekend. There were five girls that came through the Girls on Track Australian Grand Prix event that were working there, and Fantastic. it was yeah incredible to just see them because they sent me a few pictures. It was just really wholesome to see them, you know. Now budding up and working in moto. Kate was really happy because it was bikes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, we'll take the first question from Tali. Tali's been a part of the program for the last one and a half years. And her question is, what would you say are some of the necessary skills one would need to have in a motorsport comms and PR role? Um, definitely your writing skills. Um, are quite essential, although, you know, these days, obviously, there's AI up and coming and chat GPT, but at the end of the day, quality control is really important, right? So um, writing skills are important, stakeholder management. So, um, you know, there can be challenging characters and stakeholders to deal with sometimes. Um, so it's important that, you know, you're able to manage those and manage expectations as well. And um, I would say flexibility because topics um, change, you know, and also in motorsport, you know, you're usually on the road quite quite a bit. So flexibility, I would say as well. Yeah. Next okay. one is from Gia Setti. I'm so sorry, Gia, if I got your name wrong. Uh, what's the next best step to take after being in a PR comms and event role in a uni motorsport team? Yeah. Um, well, I would say um, look at industry roles. So um, obviously, you know, motorsport, um, but also manufacturers maybe or um, suppliers. So um, there's plenty of events and comms roles around, especially in the event space you now um, that the world is sort of back to, you know, what we used to know as, as normal. So I think there's there's plenty, plenty of opportunity around for both. And I guess it's great to have that background in comms and events because it's that's, you know, quite varying. Like between marketing, comms, PR, events, you can be quite fluid and you don't just have to stick to one. Like you can um sort of jump around a variety of roles there this one's a bit of a tricky one what is the most difficult part of your role the most difficult part ah oh, so <laughs> that is a tough question <laughs> yeah it is At isn't it Times dealing um, with journalists yeah oh journals all right <laughs> <laughs> In F1, it probably was just keeping up with all the travel, right? Um, but I'm not sure. What travel, it was yeah, travel can be very tiring, especially across um, different time zones. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you have to, like, you know, you arrive somewhere after, like, a long flight. Australia is a very long way away from everything. But if you're working out of Australia, uh, you usually hit the ground running. So um, that can be challenging. Sometimes if you're working across, you know, challenging situations in terms of crisis communications, that can be quite taxing. I think it's a, I always said, you know, I don't, I don't mind a good crisis if it's every once in a while, but you don't want to be in constant crisis because um, it can be quite, it's quite tiring, can be quite tiring. Yep. Um, the next one is from Erin Woolston. Erin Williston, do you think formal qualifications university in communications is uh, a necessary a, ne a necessity to work in the industry? I love all forms of motorsport. I'm a regular race official and work full time as a primary school teacher. Go you! After a previous career in spare parts, but have this never ending urge to be fully involved in motorsport. Just don't know if I need to do further study or just network like hell? Mm. I think um, the, the way sort of um, jobs evolve these days, uh, it depends on what you want to do, right? Like if you want to be an engineer, then probably going to uni is a good idea. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's soft skills like comms or even in the HR department maybe, 
um, sometimes just go for it. You know, try and you, you show you've got if you're already volunteering and you've got that connection and that passion, showcase that on your CV and and just try um you know try applying for roles. Um I've seen it in several roles. This is now in, in tech, um, more so where people um come in and they try like a junior role and they really like it, and then they go back to uni to hone their skills and get the qualifications and then come back qualified. So I think, um, yeah, if you get started, especially entry level roles, you try out, you really love it. You can always go back and get that formal qualification or run it parallel as well. Yeah, sometimes you can even get your work to pay for it if if yes, necessary. But I think I reckon just network like hell, get get in there and then work the rest out. All right. I think you've touched on this, but maybe there's something you want to add. How did you arrange meetings with press contacts at OzGP? Yeah, um, that was, I was basically in touch with these people throughout the entire previous season and just chatting with them and it happened. So they knew that I was in Australia and they were coming to the Australian Grand Prix. So that, that sort of formed naturally that we would catch up in person because we'd known each other for quite some, some time before, before that. But just speaking about that, like even through our events, we say use LinkedIn, you know, um, That's right. such, such a great resource. And like you've yeah. touched upon, sometimes people might not respond to you in a day or two or a week, but send that reminder and keep persisting. You don't need to be annoying and aggressive. It's, it's just a gentle reminder. I'm still yeah. here. You know, um, We've kept in touch for the past one and a half, one year. And I think yeah, Nadine introduced us and yes. now here we are today. That's right. <laughs> Um, I think it's sim it's kind of in the same vein. Um, it's from Crystal Fakri. Fakri, um, amazing session. Just wanted to start by saying thank you. My name is Christelle, and I've got a question about how to get into F1 and networking. I work in PR from for an automotive company in Australia, and I'm heading to Abu Dhabi soon for the GP, and I'd love to network while I'm there. Any tips on where to start? I've sent some emails and connected with some comms directors, managers on LinkedIn, but I feel I could be doing more. I've also been looking into volunteering next year, so I'm glad that's a good start too. Yeah, definitely. That's great that you've already, you know, um, started connecting with, with people, and I think that's definitely the, the right way to go. And if you're following, you know, specific specific people, see whether they are posting stuff like current stuff that they're up to on LinkedIn or even on their Insta, if it's not a private account or TikTok, and um, and take this content and pick up on it and say, how oh, this was cool, you know, I would love to, you know, meet you and pick your brain on this, or you know, um, and then yeah, hopefully it will it will happen from there. This is a great question. Um, is look you've touched upon this again, but let's just go back. Is location Australia an issue or disadvantage when applying for international roles? Are there any workarounds or ways to promote ourselves to help this? Hmm. I I definitely don't think it's a disadvantage. I think you can turn it into an advantage. Um, okay. especially when you look at Formula One. I mean, the teams are so international. People from all over the world work in a team there's all sorts of nationalities so you know you could be asking the same questions if we were sitting in brazil um or somewhere over you know on the other side of the world so and i think you know in australia we are a big country by size but by population we're not so i do believe that if you play your cards right in terms of getting that experience in your career or in the volunteering that can really shine on your CV to make it stand out. Yeah, 100%. And you've done it and there are others who've done it. So it's not impossible. And like you said, if you have that goal and you push towards that goal and you don't give up, the world's, yeah. you know, your oyster. <laughs> Another one from Nikki. Um, are there any mistakes you see comms professionals or graduates make? Oh, we all make mistakes, I think. <laughs> Um, no one is immune to mistakes. Um, <clears throat> I think um, 
sometimes I see people give up too early. Mm -hmm. If they had just hung on a little bit longer or persisted a little bit longer, they would have actually reached their goal. Um, I've seen that a few times and it's a shame because these people had really great potential and they're really great people with really good skills. And if they just hung on, you know, another month or two, sometimes six months, but then it would have been just like, you know, like a little flower that blossomed. So that's probably my biggest advice. Be persistent and don't give up. Yeah, that's fantastic advice, Steph. Uh, this one I really like. Highlight of your career so far. Highlight of my career. Hmm. There have been many. Um, that situation that I described with the journalist that was um that was pretty sweet. Um, another highlight for me was bringing the first electric vehicle for Porsche um to market. So um launching being part of the Taycan launch um was pretty phenomenal. Um, working across my my PR colleagues all over the world to sort of plan the global launch and then also launching the car in Australia was pretty special. Amazing. Um, from Taylor, I work as a social media and comms coordinator in grassroots karting. Do you think this is a good way to get noticed and gain momentum career-wise in bigger categories Australia-wide and worldwide? Do these big companies and teams look at that level? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think at the end of the day, karting is where, you know, where many, many famous drivers began and everybody in motorsport knows that. Um, and karting is also an international sport, so I think you you're in a really good spot. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, yeah. Taylor's come through the Goals on Track program as well, and she dials into every webinar we run. So well done. Always ask questions too. Always so engaged. Um, this is an interesting one. What challenge did you learn from the most, and what was the key takeaway? Yeah, what challenge? Many there's been many challenges. I think um <clears throat> I think sometimes you can get so caught up in your sort of daily work life. And this, I don't know if this this is probably applies more broadly for anyone um in the workspace, is that you might, you know, have a really difficult or challenging day or a problem at work. Um, and at the end of the day, you're like just really tired and run down and, and don't feel so good, but putting things into perspective always helps, I feel. Um, so, you know, making sure that you see the bigger picture of what's going on in the world compared to, you know, what you do, um, and the challenge that you've been facing. So I think, um, having done a lot of crisis communications in, in the roles that I've been in. As long as everybody's alive, life's pretty good. <laughs> um, yeah, so perspective definitely helps um, going through challenges. Um, from Erin, do you think age is a factor in entering motorsport as PR or comms? I'm 45, but I am ready for a change in career. Hmm. I don't think age is a, is a factor. Um, I think... These days, you know, so many people um, change careers and switch it up. So I think it's actually pretty difficult to come across someone that has been in a career for decades on end anymore. Um, I think, yeah, the world has, has changed a little bit. We all live, you know, faster lives, more informed lives. Um, and I think that applies to careers as well. So even, you know, if you look at me, motorsport, automotive, now tech, um, it's a nice industry, but at the end of the day, you're looking for new challenges. And I think that's absolutely understandable. And I think it probably also makes you better in whatever new thing you take on because you're bringing a whole different skill set from what you did before. Yeah. What a great yes. answer. I love that. I love how we're throwing these curveballs at you and you're so calm and composed. <laughs> These are, these, are, these are anything like the crisis that she's dealt with before. So, Pre, we need to go harder. <laughs> That's actually true. Um, how did you reset after a race speed that didn't quite go to plan or a crisis? 
I would think it's yeah. sailing, but I don't think you can sail everywhere you travel. <laughs> no. Oh my god. I wish I knew <laughs> sailing back then. Um, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, look. Um, you all know um Salva. You know, it's, it's not like we're. It's a it's a front running team, so it, it wasn't podiums and wins. Um, all season round. Um, definitely not. So it's it's challenging because everyone that works in the team is so passionate about it and everyone works so hard and and goes full tilt to do their best work to put everything into you know put put the driver and the car in the best possible um position finishing a race and when it doesn't go your way um it's hard and people get frustrated but at the end of the day, you know, you work as a team and and you share that and you you transform that into looking forward to the next race. Um and then and then take that sort of transformed energy into into what you're doing next. Yeah, well, I think I'd hide under the blanket for days. <laughs> I don't think you yeah, just crawl I'm... under the table. Oh. <laughs> There's always an next race after Sorry, the race. Oh. That's true. Exactly. There's always another race. Um, so Pre, I reckon we will wrap it. Do you want to do one more? We've got two to... Oh sure. Let's. You can pick okay. one. Mm. Oh, this is good. good. Oh, my thank you. When is the right time to start reaching out to motorsport to potential employers, etc.? Do they want to hear from second, third, or third year uni students or recent graduates? Mm. Um, I think it probably depends a little bit on um, the role you're going for. So uh, I'm by no means across what um, sort of roles are going in F1 at the moment, but um, Say, for example, if you're going for a graduate role, um, you know, there would be application deadlines and stuff like that. So definitely make sure you're you're aware of that. Um, because sometimes the recruitment process is just a little a little bit a little bit longer for those. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um... Right. You wanna do one more? Okay, <laughs> we will do um do you feel like it's necessary to know a lot about the specific sport or team before you start working in it? I would say yes, because you make your job a little bit easier. I Absolutely. Think, and the interview yeah. as well, knowing the history of it. Yeah. 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 Get that prep and research done so you've got something to connect with them and to talk about and to impress them with your your knowledge your lengthy knowledge of their their team or whatever the organization is um, we're at eight o'clock pre yeah i think we're good wrap up well let's say the biggest thank you to steph for uh, giving Thanks her for time, me. busy, busy, busy lady. Uh, super cool to have you on, Steph. I hope um, I know all the everybody watching is going to get so much from this webinar. Um, you really are a fascinating person, so I can't wait to catch up with you at the next Girls on Track event or whatever it is that we that we connect um, connect at. Um, for those listening, the Girls on Track Pathways events, which are for fifteen to twenty two year olds, um, they provide the opportunity to to meet not just the Girls on Track team, but um, also professionals in the industry, just like Steph, um, who want to support more women uh, in the motorsport and automotive industry because we're all here to see each other succeed. Um, thank you so much for dialing in tonight. If you want any more information on the Girls on Track programs, get in touch with Priyanka at Girls on Track at motorsport.org. Got AU. We have one more Pathways event for um, this year. It's around the corner, the Adelaide 500. Um, so we're planning 2024 Girls on Track um, 
and the career development and mentoring event, which is held at F1 um, down in Melbourne, has has commenced. So um, I highly recommend that you all put in your applications for this because the event is bonkers good um, and there's going to be lots of applications coming through. And um, and we will let you know when when that information is out so that you can get those applications in. Um, thank you for having me. And um, any final words, Steph? Uh, thanks so much for having me on. I hope um, I was able to provide some insight and some great um, tips. And I can't wait um, to see what what you guys all, all get up to. And um, I can't wait to follow follow your careers and um, seeing your your dreams come true. So oh, good. good. Excellent. Thank you, so Thank much, you Priyanka, for facilitating this marvellous chat. And we'll catch you, Legends, later. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Thanks everyone. for having me. Bye.